Morgan Young. Morgan has worked in the Canadian publishing industry since 2006 and, cons and considers herself very lucky to be part of the amazing team at Ampersand. Beginning as a sales rep in southwestern Ontario, she has spent her career working with many amazing independent chain and big box retailers across the country. Morgan became vice president of Ampersand in 2016 and teaches book sales and marketing at Centennial College. Please join me in welcoming our panel. For those of you who don't know, um, Ampersand is a national sales agency. So I put that out there. But And one of my favorite things about my job at Ampersand is how I get to aid in the collaboration between publishers and bookstores and between publishers, bless you, and sales reps, please, sorry, between publishers and libraries. What is probably the most important part of my job is not just talking, although I definitely do a lot of that, but I think it's listening. I listen to our publishers tell us about the books that they're gonna publish and why they're gonna publish them. I listen to my booksellers and buyers and librarians tell me about what's working for them and not working for them and why and things that they've done in the past to promote a title or an event or their store or their library and things that they would like to do, like to try to do in the future. And of course, the things that they hear from their customers and their patrons. My colleagues at Ampersand are, of course, having similar conversations with different booksellers and buyers and librarians all across the country, and we make a point of regularly coming together and sharing that information with each other and with our publishers. I cannot overstate the value, how valuable this, in, this insight is into the strength and success of Ampersand. Sharing this information not only allows us as individuals to share our successes and our failures and our triumphs and our frustrations, which by the way, all by itself is really important, but it also allows us to provide feedback to our publishers on titles, trends, and changes in the industry. And when we do, they know that that's coming from a very large knowledge base with a vast amount of experience. In short, it makes us all better at what we do. So we're very lucky in this industry that we have a lot of people who are very creative and passionate and who love what they do. And not only that, but they're happy to share their experiences and their best practices with the rest of the industry in this same way. Because what is the expression? A rising tide lifts all boats, right? So our panel is a perfect example of that. Laura Ash, welcome Laura, is the co-owner of Another Story Bookshop in Roncesvalles neighborhood in Toronto. Drawn to another story for its commitment to making social impact through books, Laura is determined to ensure Sheila Kaufman's legacy lives on and another story continues to bring alternative titles to new generations of readers. Megan Byers grew up surrounded by books, literally. Maya Byers, her mother, started Babar Books in 1986 when she was just a toddler. As a part of a family-owned and operated children's bookstore, she's committed to promoting literacy and a love of reading. Megan is the manager in charge of schools, libraries, social media, and events, and she hosts a monthly teen advisory board. Chris Hall has worked in the book industry at McNally Robinson Booksellers since 1996. He started, a book he started as a bookseller and in 2015 officially took over as co-owner with Lori Baker, his business partner. They now own McNally Robinson and Prairie Inc. restaurants in Winnipeg and Saskatoon, as well as Skylight Books, a school wholesaler based in Winnipeg. They opened a new small store at the Forks in Winnipeg in early 2018. Ruth Linka began her career in publishing at Coteau Books, a literary publisher, working in promotions and editorial. Since then, she's worked at Raincoast Books, New West Press, and in 2001, she formed Brindle and Glass with her business partner, Lee Shedden, for which they were awarded Emerging Pub Publisher of the Year at the 2003 Alberta Book Awards. Arriving at Touchwood in 2007 with Brindle and Glass in tow, Ruth worked as the publisher for Touchwood Editions, of which B&G is the literary imprint. In 2014, Ruth moved to Orca Book Publishers, where she's now a partner. She is currently on the Association of Canadian Publishers Council and the Victoria Book Prize Society. In the past, she's served on boards such as the Association of Book Publishers of BC, the Literary Press Group of Canada, the Book Publishers of Alberta, and various community theatres and Athmika Punja. Athmika works closely with sales, fulfillment, and customer service on projects to, Im to improve their customer supply chain. To improve their supply chain, sorry. Her team at Penguin Random House Canada covers customer operations, sales assistant, publisher operations, as well as co-op processes. Prior to her three years at PRHC, she was in operations at ECW Press for four years. 
So welcome, everybody. So we've had a, um, an awesome chance to chat a couple of times leading up to this panel, which is, was awesome, it was very helpful, I found. And a couple of things that we touched on that I wanted to make sure that we brought up. The first one, I think I'm gonna start with the bookseller. So Laura, if it's all right with you, I'll start with you. Okay. Readers' expectations surrounding discoverability have changed a lot in recent years. This is just one reason that identifying the next bestseller has gotten increasingly difficult, and it is more often that retailers find themselves chasing unexpected bestsellers. When this happens, supply chain reaction time is even more important. So from the bookseller perspective, what are ways that publishers can help with this? Okay, so I'll kind of take a certain direction, is that one of the things I mentioned when we were talking earlier is that for us being in Toronto, it's really, it's much easier for us to get books than a lot of other places. Um, we can keep our numbers down, um, but uh, years ago when we lost a bunch of um, warehouses in Canada, it took a long time for that to kind of catch up. We were taking, you know, it was taking weeks upon weeks to actually get books in, and now for the most part a lot of publishers have really understood that, that the turnaround time is really important. It's important because I don't have to order 50 of something each time, I can order, you know, in quantities of five and ten, we can move things, we can turn around things, and it just makes the entire process much easier. Um, so for us, it's, it's publishers acknowledging the fact that uh, booksellers need to get books on a very timely basis. I don't know if you guys experience that. In, yes. Yeah. Dealing with customers, and I deal a lot with special orders. Um, I need that turnaround time. I need to be able to say to them, I'm putting this book on order for you. I will call you in a week when it arrives. Or I'll, I need to be able to give them a, a definite answer. Um, and then, my, or my other option is to say, um, you know, we'll just call you when it arrives and they don't know when that is. And, and that, that can, they're less likely then to um, order from me. Yes. Um, and especially when a title is popular, um, if I see already that I've sold maybe three or four, then I'm going to maybe, even though I have still ten in stock, then I'm going to order another, you know, five or ten because I see that it's moving quite quickly, quite fast. But I need to be able to make sure that I don't run out. And, and so that... Uh, yeah, that's definitely a, a concern for me. Yeah, in my time uh, over the years, I, I feel like I, um, I don't foresee bestsellers as uh, well as I used to. Um, the next book by name your, your familiar author may or may not uh, work as planned. Uh, so I find that there are titles, as I start to refer to them as, that are just coming at me unexpectedly. And so I'm paying a lot more attention than I used to to uh, the BookNet bestsellers. Uh, because some of those books may not be flying off my shelves yet, so I get on them and bring in uh, copies of those books. Uh, so I guess there's two two angles for me. Is one is certainly the uh, the response time. If I am chasing those titles, then the faster I'm getting those back in, the better. Um, and then the other side of it is is if publishers aren't as blind as I feel to these bestsellers, then the faster you can get word to me that something's going to go or you see the signs uh, of it going, then uh, we can respond that much earlier. So I, I would say that if there's a, a couple, of, uh, couple of angles that would help uh, on that front. Ruth, from the publisher perspective, what are the, some things that you find that you are doing in order to try and do exactly that and chase those bestsellers? Well, we're always telling you at sales conference that the books are going to be bestsellers. Yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, like I, I think for any of the surprise um, books, you know, we we keep a very close eye on inventory so that we have um, the reprint arriving before we run out of stock. So I think that's an important thing. Um, we have a our warehouse is out practically on the edge of the country in Victoria, which is. Uh, some would say here in, in, in Ontario, not the smartest place to have a warehouse and a distribution center. Um, so we, we work really hard to get our orders out the same day that we get them so that at least we're not holding things up for that reason that, um, you know, there's still the geography of Canada 
um, but filling orders quickly and being uh, as responsive as we can on, on inventory. There are many salespeople here who don't want me to talk to about <laughs> what makes a bestseller. Uh, but I think that from my work, which often touches getting books to retailers as quickly as possible, because consumer expectation has shifted like in the last few years to want things more immediately, we found that investing in getting things to store faster, making sure that all of the parts of our supply chain are working, has had an overall impact on all of our books. And so whether it's special orders or the title that you know is gonna start moving fast or the title that you don't see coming, um, investing in supply chain and, and listening to retailers and the feedback that they're giving us from different parts of the country and making changes to, to improve those things has had a really important impact um, on our overall business. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we ended up spending a lot of time talking about the things that we do, but and in our conversation we talked a lot about um, what are some things that we would like to see done that would make it better? Is there any comments about any of that? I know that one of the big things as we discussed was um, discoverability and, and data comes in, plays a huge role in that. Um, another part, as Ruth had mentioned before, was just, just the sheer geography of our country um, can cause some problems, especially in our uh, long winter. Happy first day of spring, by the way, everybody. <laughs> but, um, and, and also, I had another thought in there that was, oh, and the big communication is obviously an enormous part of that. I mean, I, I was on my Christmas holidays, of course, with when one of our books that we didn't, weren't sure exactly what it was going to do, Fire and Fury, was suddenly, it was huge, um, as you know. So we were, oops, we were left in a position that suddenly we were getting on the phone and on email at all hours trying to make sure that we had enough stock and the stock was in stores and the stock was everywhere that we could possibly get it so uh, th so we could get we didn't miss out on those sales is there anything well one of the things that I found especially this holiday season um, is that managed titles that we once had to really worry about um, we were actually starting to see bits and pieces of stock so just from having conversations with other booksellers I think that managed titles were actually managed better um, Indies saw stock whereas before you would see chapters in Indigo's warehouses fill up and you know people being like oh I can get it on Amazon or at Costco or mm -hmm. wherever mm -hmm. um, we actually could say guess what we have stock too um, and I think that prior years uh, I would have to say that that wasn't always the case the in, the indie market was kind of left out when you know you were kind of going down on, on the wire with some of the titles mm -hmm. so for us I think that really helped mm -hmm. and that was something that we really appreciated I, I would describe the last year as a bit of an anomaly. The, uh, in the last several years, um, I have felt well treated and uh, supplied. Uh, years ago, uh, not so much. Uh, yeah. Sales would all go somewhere else and then there'd be out of stocks and we couldn't get any more. Mm -hmm. um, that reared its head again this past Christmas uh, for printing issues and things, I think, beyond uh, everyone's control. So I, I think it was an anomaly, but it didn't feel like I was ill treated. It was just a confluence of a number of events. So booksellers really have their finger on the pulse of trends and customer demand, and as such are in a great position to move the dial in terms of trends and sales in this industry. The U.S. has IndieBound, which provides some awesome opportunities for independent booksellers to influence book sales and trends in that country. What are independent retailers in Canada doing at their end to help create the next bestseller and what could be done? I think that um, in the spirit of collaboration, keeping really open lines of communication between reps and uh, the folks internally, uh, where the reps are being advocates for uh, independent bookstores, um, when those voices are really loud, um, the kind of support that a publisher is able to put be towards um, positioning something really well at an independent or, or uh, targeting an initiative towards uh, independent booksellers is, mm -hmm. is a lot higher. So I think that keeping those lines of communication open um, is, is really the best way of doing that. Yeah. When I speak about uh, unexpected bestsellers, that's just part of the equation because we are generating our own, our own publicity and our own bestsellers. Uh, it's actually one of the key ways and the primary way of, uh, that, that I think of ourselves as independent, even more than, uh, than ownership uh, definitions. 
we select the books we want to get behind. And so our newsletter has our choices and as much as possible comes from uh, our booksellers who are reading and myself who uh, reads as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And so we are constantly uh, taking our best shot at setting things up to succeed. Uh, we're having a lot of luck. So, so that, that is something um, absolutely uh, that we do and successfully. Uh, our newsletter is kind of the core of that, but so are events. So a lot of our bestsellers are event-driven. Um, we set up uh, displays for, for books. So, so a lot of that work is getting done. Um, so my, my previous comments about, about bestsellers uh, th that I'm not expecting, uh, is I just want more all the time. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Cool. We'll add a since we're here at Booknet Tech Forum. Uh, one of the ways that Booknet has made it really easy to identify where independents are very strong is the independence aggregate on sales data. Mm -hmm. I think that makes it really visible to publishers and and the folks who are looking at that data to see where independents are uh, are doing really well with titles um, that aren't necessarily. Uh, finding that traction in the rest of the marketplace. And when you have uh, that kind of uh, groundswell for marketing and publicity, it also tells you maybe other ways that you could be positioning that or other places you could be positioning that to, to really make a book uh, get the, the most sales that it could. Yeah. So using that is good for publishers. Well, I think um, if and when we get another Canadian independent booksellers association, we could then pool our resources as independents and, and do what they're doing um, in the US to some degree. And we could help then create the next bestseller if, I mean, I there are so many titles that I don't have a chance to read everything. And mm -hmm. we specialize in, in children's only, so I don't really bring in much adult, but I can then say, well, these are you know five kids' books that I adore, and I will tell all the other independents, well, if you are only going to take five books, these are the five that you should take. And the same with them, I could get the information, oh, you love these two sort of adult YA crossovers? Well, I'll. I'll make sure that I have those two. And it's also a way that we could uh, support more uh, Canadian literature as well, making sure that um, that we're not just taking uh, from the States, that we're supporting our own culture. Mm -hmm. I will champion everything that Megan just said, <laughs> um, because I think that, yes, uh, in, in the association is something that is necessary. Um, but above that, I think that, I guess, for us specifically, um, I will change hats. We are also a wholesaler, so um, we do a lot of our work and a lot of our like bestsellers um, in that department uh, come from speaking directly with educators. Mm -hmm. So our staff read almost every YA book. We um, we have to pretty much vet everything because we're it was very if anyone knows our store, we're very specific. Um, and so, so yeah, so it's it's talking. It's like that one-on-one -on -one talking with kids, talking with teachers, um, and collaborating that way. And that's kind of how we generate our bestsellers in the store, mm -hmm. which is it's kind of nice because it's not just you know uh, yes we have staff picks. Every bookshop has staff picks, and you know we we push what we love. Um, we're all avid readers, but it's also that engagement with other people that make it make it possible. So when working with uh, schools and libraries, um, they deal with specific topics. Uh, we just had a change in Quebec for our um, sex ed curriculum um, or sexuality education. They, they have a very long name for it now, but it's now starting in kindergarten, and so we're looking at the backlist. And I've actually looked at a lot of what happened here in Ontario uh, to find some of those titles and to, and then now I look at every new book that's coming in and saying, oh, does this relate to one of these themes that they're now teaching and how can I, how can I promote that or, or 
wedge it in. And I think that creating, I mean, and that's what this is about, right? Is creating any opportunity for all of us to talk to each other in order to compare best practices and figure out what are you doing yeah. that you, where you're finding more opportunities and who are you talking to that helps you find the opportunities that you're, com that you're finding in your store. Our sales reps are amazing too. I wanted, I, I just really wanted to throw it out there that we have amazing sales reps and they're, they're, they're great. Like, you know, because a lot of times it's, it's really hard. You're going, you're slapping through catalogs and it's like, okay, I need something on a topic that maybe we don't have a lot of, and a sales rep, they'll kn they know their stuff. So it's very easy to reach out to a few, a few of them and they can say, this is, this is what's going on, this is what's new. You know, they, have all the they have all the information there. Mm -hmm. And they can help with backlist as well, which yeah. is great. I'm not her rep, by the way, just <laughs> to put that out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there's, so going back to the note of, um, or the comment about CBA. So there are some regional booksellers associations across the country. So what would need to happen in order to bring about, and this is again a very big question and is something that we could, you know, can we everybody clear their schedules please? But um, what needs to happen in order f for something like that to work? Really we need support. We're booksellers. We're not Financial support. Yeah. Well, any type of support, right? Like, I mean, to start an association, it's great just to have a few people talking about it, but none of us are experts. I mean, mm -hmm. if it's an association no. on how to sell books, I mean, you can talk to us, but it's it's bigger than that. And um, and there has been. That's I think the one takeaway I will say is that when having a conversation regarding um, an, an association, there is a lot of uh, a lot of energy behind it and there is a lot of energy that does come from publishers and we see it mm -hmm. and we feel it and I think that we just need some sort of platform to maybe not here but we do need to have some sort of platform to actually talk about it in a larger scale because there's you know as much as booksellers sellers want it publishers want it too because it's a body of booksellers that you can speak towards so I think the first time we talked about this, um, Megan really highlighted some of the things that having a, a national bookseller organization might support. Um, and like I was at Winter Institute um, and uh, it's run by the American Booksellers Association. And you know, one of the ideas that they had was this publisher events grid. Um, and uh, Edelweiss allows uh, publishers to put, uh, to upload all of the titles that they're trying to position um, in, in, the, in the season that they're selling. Uh, and it's a, it's a tool that then allows all of the booksellers nationally to look at the marketing plans for those titles and submit event proposals. And it's really the buy-in of all of the publishers and all of the booksellers into that one system that allows for like a much better, more robust way of, of planning your events and, and making sure that there are events that are going to independent booksellers and, and making sure that when an author is doing uh, some kind of publicity or media tour, they're taking advantage of every opportunity to do an event and to reach as many readers as possible. I think that's one of the things that, like one idea that comes out of having a, a national booksellers organization that just helps sort of spearhead and, and advocate for tools and, and programs like that uh, uh, finding legs. And it, it's a way that we could all then work together. So bookstores could say, um, could s sort of buddy up and say, okay, well, you'll, this author will come to my store in the morning, but then they can go to a second store in the afternoon and we can put a joint proposal together and just create more of a, a community. And Is then the publishers too would get more um, publicity, I think, through that. And, and I, I notice it's, it's often an author will go to Vancouver, Toronto, and maybe one other Canadian city. And if you wanted to do a, a longer tour, because we are so, we are such a large country, uh, I, something like that I think could really help fill in those gaps, like doing a, a concert tour for a, a band, you know? You have a, an indie author and it goes to all the indie stores and you could get more, I think, more bang for your buck. It occurs to me that, um, that we almost need some sort of event that, that is an excuse to, to meet. 
I went to yes. Albuquerque and met Megan. Yes. And now I've met Laura here. And, and so, and I don't know how feasible it is for small stores to, to uh, travel. So there's mm -hmm. time, there's, there's money that's needed for, to even bring There's independent conference calling. Well, well sure, but, calling. but that's not the same yeah. as, it's, as, it's uh, no. as meeting, but. like once in a while to actually meet. And then the conference calling, I think, is much more productive mm -hmm. thereafter. So, yeah, I, I mean, in terms of just legitimate support to get something going, maybe we just need to pool some money together and, and uh, allow some flights to be purchased. Have a party. <laughs> like, Who wants I, to throw us a party? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. You're all invited. Creating any opportunity for um, for communication like that would be really important. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, or maybe Ruth, in your experience in the on the West Coast, do you think that um, I feel like that there's more booksellers per capita out there? Is that true? Yeah, I, I kind of do so too. So, do you think that there <laughs> there is more communication between the bookstores be, for that reason? Well, there like, is an association. We just need more bookstores. Is that what this is coming down to? Or is part of it? Um, maybe. There, I mean, there is there is an association in BC for the booksellers, and and you know we the publishers can talk to the association as a whole, or put something by them for a special promotion. So, uh, we we right now we're running a, a read local BC. Uh, promotion that is between the publishers and the booksellers, but it's sort of um, administered by the association on behalf of the booksellers. Mm -hmm. um, it also allows us to do more sort of group communication, um, which is more efficient for everybody. We, w we do a lot of work with authors in schools, so if they go to a city for a school visit, then we try and let the bookstore in that city know that mm -hmm. the author's going to be in town, there might be an increased demand for their book while they're there, but again, it's, it's, we have to remember to do it, or, or um, it, it's all, uh, there's no automation, there's no way of sort of doing it efficiently, so, um, but yeah, in, in BC, there, the, the bookstores also um, are very collegial there, um, and I don't know if that's the case everywhere, but um, what we were talking about earlier where, you know, you would share your five favorite books, I think that sounds great, but what seems to be a little bit more the case, for instance, in Victoria, is the five bestsellers at one store may not be the same exactly. at the other store down the street. They, they kind of create their own um, brand and have maybe a different market. So um, maybe they feel they don't compete as much, so there's collegiality. Yeah, I think that's an important part of um, their success as well, right? They've each found their individual markets. I mean, and maybe that's also where communication is important, right? So they know that these are your five favorite books. These are the ones that you're really promoting and you're going to do well with. So if you were down the street, you would, regardless of your focus, maybe collegiality means you're not focusing on those titles. Yep. You know? Do you find that you, are, you have a relationship with the other booksellers in Toronto, that you talk to them? If um, there's, and if there's opportunity to talk to them, do you make a point? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think that since I'm in a very unique position because I'm a, I'm very a new owner, mm. so I have tons of excuses to ask people to hang out with me. Um, Good. And, you know, it's, but I think that... No, I, th I think that for, for me it's been, it's, it's not been too much of an issue. Um, the, the books shop that... I help run is very different than most bookshops in the city, so I don't know if people yeah. actually look at me as competition. I mean, I would hope not. Yeah, no, I think that that's I th right. I think that for indies, and I don't know if everyone feels this way, but my competition is not the indie next door or the indie down the street or the indie in the next neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, for me, if another bookshop opened up close to me, I, I find that actually very exciting because that means that the industry is very healthy. Yeah. Um, and then that means that there's less buying happening elsewhere. Um, but no, I think that I, I, I would like to say that, that things are, are different and similar, but I, I, I feel maybe deep down that I know that they're not, that there needs to be more collaboration. I mean, I will say on the record that Ontario is the only province that doesn't have an association, so that might be telling in itself. I think what you said about the, your competitor not being the indie bookstore in your town or whatever is is really important, and, and that's partly where I think all of us, but um, 
certainly publishers can do more to um, educate our, our market and our readers um, and your readers <laughs> to to buy local and 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 that you know fast is not always um, the best <laughs> and, and that there are other options and other things that you get by going into a bookstore so I think that's a ongoing campaign that we should all be participating yeah, in. Well, here, here. Can I can I just say one of the things that publishers are starting to do well, and we're on social media a lot, um, is that they actually do recommend bookshops more. Um, we do a lot of events. Uh, we're in Toronto. A lot of authors come through, so the bookstores, all the bookstores here, benefit from that. Um, but you know, they, they make sure that they're always asking for our logo. They're always making sure that we're. Um, you know, some of the greatest events we ever have, for me, isn't sometimes how many books we sell, but the fact that, you know, the, the person who's presenting from the publisher says, you know, great things about my bookshop. So they, you know, I don't know how many times you sometimes go to a, an event and no one mentions that books are for sale and who they're from. Well, when those little things happen, it means so much because you're letting an entire community, that might not be my community, but an entire community of, of booksellers know like, oh, it's an independent. I haven't heard of them before. Let me check them out. Oh, it's their bookmark or, you know, so I think there's a lot of that happening now um, and, and I'm loving it. So I don't know if you That's guys great. experience the same thing with some of the stuff you do. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I think every event that we do, we get a couple of new customers, somebody new who hasn't been to the store before. And once someone comes into our store, they almost always come back unless they like move away. Yeah. But I, I hear nothing but great things. Oh my God, I've never been here before. I'm definitely coming back. This place is lovely. Um, and we try and always give the best um, experience as possible. So I like doing in-store events. Yeah, so just bringing so they people can, in. Is, because that's, yeah. that's uh, I think that's the best way to, to get them and keep them. That's great. Um, and in talking, to, in talking about um, Laura's comments about social media, and it really does make a difference to get that, it does. Um, to be tagged and recognized and all of those things. And I, yeah. Clearly, I'm just going to show how much how little I know about social media. But um, I hear from <laughs> no, our publishers all the time as well that the reverse is also true. You know, mm -hmm. you're picturing, you're taking pictures of books and posting them on social media, or something that you're doing to promote a display or an event or a, or some, a theme of something that you're doing really well with in store. When it's their books, to tag them, tag the author and the publisher. They always we always get a lot, we hear a lot about that, and we're always mm -hmm. very excited when that happens. So thank you about that. That's, that's one of my theories for why it's uh, in this day and age there's so many surprising titles that are suddenly bestsellers yeah. because word of mouth now is social media. So if I read a book and enjoy it and tell my friends, I don't just tell half a dozen people. I tell 100 plus. That's right. And so that's when these things start to explode. So the more we're tapped into, A, taking advantage of that and, and playing our own role within it, but also responding to it is, um, yeah, tying that back into sales and ordering and... And yeah, so on. and the logistics and the timing and the supply chain and all of that. And we had mentioned before about um, how one of the things that independent bookstores are really good at is, is, and again, you have to go in store for this, is if I'm looking for this book that I've heard about on social media and it's you don't have it in stock, but an indie is, the great, is a great place to hear, well, we don't have that one, but can I, instead of, if, you, if you're interested in that one, can I recommend this one instead? Also, if you forget the name of the book, if you come in and say it had a blue cover, of course. Uh, there's a good chance I'll know what, which book that is. That's true. Which you might not get. You can't it. Google the one with the blue cover, yeah. right? Yeah. It's a bit hard. That's true. Or you can, but yeah, it's a lot harder. And we also hand sell Canadian titles. You know, we hand sell our local authors. We hand sell um, the, we hand sell, like that's just, you, you don't find that anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So. Can I hijack the rest of the uh, panel? Yeah, what's that? I'd like to advocate for something based on this morning's keynote address, and that is uh, indigenous publishing. Um, when we set up our uh, store in the Forks, uh, it's 1,000 square feet. We have a 25,000 square foot store uh, in Winnipeg and, and in Saskatoon. We have about 
45 shelves of indigenous books in the big stores. We put in 15 in the, uh, the thousand square foot store at the Forks. The Forks in Winnipeg is an, an ancient meeting site for indigenous people. So it felt right, it felt like something we do well. We do a lot of events with indigenous books. And the response has been amazing. Uh, the whole community is buying books from that store. Uh, families coming in and buying kids uh, indigenous books for for their kids from all the communities of Winnipeg. I think it's a real um, necessity in this country and in, in our city in particular and our two cities because uh, Winnipeg and Saskatoon are on the, on the front edge of this, uh, of this uh, calamity. And um, so, yeah, there are many, many stories to be told uh, from that community and I would uh, urge everyone to tap into uh, the great storytellers that are coming from there. Sorry. Don't be sorry. I think that that's great. And I think that that's exactly why you want to have a conversation with your booksellers, because this is it's exactly the kind of feedback that we're looking for to take back to publishers in order to fulfill that kind of demand, which I think that they're doing. And that is a trend that we've heard um, started more in the West, and it's taken a little while for, uh, for that for those kinds of books, wrote books on indigenous topics by indigenous authors um, to really take off on, in Ontario anyways. And yeah. now we're really seeing it as well. It's, in, it's true. It's Absolutely. And a lot, a lot of our shelf space is taken up by local publishers. So they're from Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Right. They're the ones producing these things. So it just needs to spread from there. Yeah. Well, one, one of the things that I thought was interesting was someone had mentioned earlier about there's like a lack of data. And fair, there's, there's a lack of data because bookstores might not be taking a chance. But there actually are bookshops who are taking a chance. And maybe you're just looking at the data wrong. I mean, I don't know much about data, but I mean, <laughs> if, but if you look at the bookshops, that their mandate is to make sure that they have queer content, uh, black authors, LGBTQ, um, uh, trans, indigenous, and see how well they're doing, you'll realize that there is a need for that. There's mm -hmm. a want for that, and there's no risk. Like, and no, there isn't. Like it's, it's not altruism. No, <laughs> I, that's I, I, that's I, I, I just I don't understand. It's uh, I I run a, a teen advisory board slash book club, and if you speak to the teens, none of them are are turned off by um, LGBT. They're actually craving it. They want more. They want more diversity. Um, we did a book, Dear Martin, and I, my store is in a pretty white, middle-class area, and there was a girl who said, I never would have read this book. I'm so glad I did. I didn't realize that this could be someone's life. Just because, you know, she's 13 and just yeah. hasn't, hasn't been exposed to anything really yet, so... Um, That's just awesome. because they're not, you know, yes, we want to um, have books uh, written by people of color for people of color, but we also, white people also read those books too. They're, a good book is a good book. Yeah, no, and contrary to what some people think, yes, right? Yeah, no, it's true. Like they, you don't need to... Um, look like that character to respond to a character. Yeah. One of the things that BNC, Noah, provided a very cool statistic, and to go back to that comment that you made about you really are, independents really do champion um, Canadian author titles. The statistic was that 10% of all print books sold in Canada are Canadian author titles, but if you just look at the independents, 20% of those books um, sold through independents across Canada are Canadian authored. So why do you think that is? We support local. You do it very consciously. Do you think the vast majority of those are just your local, local no. authors, local to you as opposed to local to Laura? You know what I mean? That I or is it Canadian? Local, as in Point Claire, as in Montreal, as in Quebec, as in Canada. You do. Yeah, no, I, I consider Canadian local. Yeah, I have like twelve more questions about that. That's <laughs> great. But before I do that, does anybody else want to? Well, I would define that in terms of diversity, too, that I want a certain amount of local in our newsletter, and I want a certain amount of regional, and I want a certain amount of Canadian, and then mm. beyond that, we'll, uh, we'll go. So it's a choice that we make to, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it, is it so? It's as opposed to well, and as you say, a vast majority of the titles on those shelves for indigenous voices are from your local publishers as well. So they're also um, answering it responding to a need and opportunity there as well. Uh, do you think that there are opportunities that come from Canadian publishers that don't come from non-Canadian publishers? Or do you think that there are opportunities that should come from Canadian publishers in order to help with that more? Because of course it's what we all want, right? I think, I think we're up against marketing there because the, uh, yeah. uh, the size of the US is just so big to be able to generate all that excitement. So part of the challenge is to generate excitement about Canadian stories and mm -hmm. uh, our customers respond to local stories. They love yeah. local stories and so then they love regional stories and they love Canadian stories. They want to read these things. It's just how do you, how do you have them come into our store looking for that book? Mm -hmm. That's the trick mm -hmm. and, and so we need to get those social media, uh, uh, that buzz going for Canadian books. I think that uh, that support that comes from independence for local content really does support Canadian publishing programs um, and create spaces where authors feel like they are valued and taken care of and, and that the work that they're doing is important. And, and so it really does contribute to the ecosystem of Canadian publishing uh, in, in an important way that supports authors, people that work uh, in, in those publishing programs as well as, as readers. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think that statistic is, is part of how we should be thinking about how we position our books, mm. um, a, a position local content. Um, and an, another, I don't know if it's a statistic, but certainly we've seen that there's been a growth in independent bookstores, both in the number and the sales that are coming out of that yeah. channel. Um, we've seen stores open up in Montreal, out east, out west, and in Toronto um, at a higher rate than in previous years. Um, and, and so being able to capitalize on that growth uh, for our readers and for our authors is, is an important thing to be mindful of. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, and thank you, very, thank you all to all, all of our panelists, and thank you very much to BookNet for organizing this, because ultimately this is, as I say, why we're here, to share best practices and all of that sort of thing. So thank you.